Uh, what the heck is going on here? <clears throat> All right, if you can hear me, I'm having a hard time here. Give me one second. Uh, I don't know what the heck is happening here. What the heck is going on? Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, we'll get started in a little bit. I'm just setting up my uh, all my stuff. It's uh, kind of weird. Yeah, uh, I can't really read that. Oh, uh, Alina, to answer your question, uh, I uh, just posted it, so it should take a little bit for YouTube to upload it. But yeah, I, I will make every day's lecture um, available. All right. 
Okay, I wonder how much of a delay there is today. Uh, hopefully significantly less. Um, hard to tell. Oh, there is a pretty significant delay. Uh, okay, we'll figure it out. Uh, okay, guys, we're going to start at 11, so I'll wait until more people trickle in, and then we'll uh, we'll get started, okay? Uh, can you guys see me? Like, um, you can see me here, and you can see the, um, the text up there that people are typing. Uh, again, uh, I don't think I was able to fix the delay. I'll have to look into it um, a little bit more tomorrow. That's okay. <clears throat> okay, so the quality I think is good. I think I'm just going to have to uh, um, just wait uh, for what to trickle in here. Mm -hmm. I'm getting my PowerPoint set up. Have my notes set up. Uh, how's everyone doing? Just while you're waiting for me to get set up here. All right, so we're still experiencing uh, quite a big uh, delay here, uh, quite a bit lag. Um, so if I don't get to your questions, uh, you know, immediately, let me know. Um, let's see, looking through a few of your comments. Okay, you guys can hear me. Okay, good. Uh, uh, thank you, Justin. Yes, it's uh, it's a nice shirt. I got it from uh, one of the current uh, sophomores. Uh, shout out to Victoria. Uh, da -da 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 -da. <laughs> yes, uh, Mia. I'm sure a lot of us would much rather be at uh, <laughs> at school, but. Oh well. Alright guys, I'm gonna get some water uh, and then we'll get started. Sound good? Alright, I'll be right back.
Um, all right, I'm ready. Let's get started. Hello, everyone. Good morning. So today we are going to continue with our online lectures, and today's topic is, of course, the evolution of an incomplete animal. Uh, okay, so I'm looking through some of the comments. Uh, uh, Miguel, yes, it does have a stream delay setting. Yes, I turned it off. I think it might just be my internet connection. I'll figure it out tomorrow. Okay, so a couple of quick items before we begin. Uh, as I'm sure a lot of you have heard, uh, there's a very real possibility. Uh, I think the governor announced yesterday or early today that uh, the school year might be over. Um, it's a real possibility, and uh, we might not see each other until uh, the summer. So that being said, obviously I am working on digitizing my curriculum. But uh, be aware, I'll be doing my best to educate you and bring you philosophy in these uh, trying times. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, I'm doing this obviously for you, but uh, also for my own sanity. Uh, it gives me something to do. So before we got started with today's lesson, I kind of want to bring your attention, you know, not all philosophy is super duper negative. Um, and in fact, I think to supplement my curriculum after we finish Wittgenstein, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to lecture you guys on uh, some stoicism. So I actually have a book here, uh, the handbook of Epictetus, a classical stoic in which he uh, makes the argument that what makes people, like what people should strive for is not pleasure or even happiness. What we strive for is tranquility or peace of mind. And so I want to share with you just the first, uh, the opening of Epictetus's handbook with you guys, because honestly, I feel like a lot of us could use a little stoic philosophy right now, uh, especially since we're all trapped indoors. <clears throat> so Epictetus uh, starts off by saying, some things are up to us, and some are not up to us. Our opinions are up to us, and our impulses, desires, aversions. In short, whatever is our own doing. Our bodies are not up to us, nor are our possessions, our reputations, or our public offices, or, that is, whatever is not our own doing. The things that are up to us are by nature free, unhindered, and unimpeded. The things that are not up to us are weak, enslaved, hindered, not our own. So remember, if you think that things naturally enslaved are free, or that things not your own are your own, you will be thwarted, miserable, and upset, and will blame both gods and men. So essentially what he's saying is, you have to recognize that there are some things that are in your control, and things that are not in your control. So for instance, this uh, outbreak, this pandemic, this quarantine is not within your control. What is within your control is your attitude, your discipline, and your own peace of mind. That is within your own control. He continues, but if you only think that only what is yours is yours, and that what is not your own is, just as it is not your own, then no one will ever coerce you, no one will hinder you, you will blame no one, you will not accuse anyone, you will not do a single thing unwillingly, you will have no enemies, and no one will harm you, because you will not be harmed at all. So essentially, what Epictetus is saying there is if you can accept the idea that, okay, I am responsible for myself and my own actions, and I am not responsible for anything else outside of me, then there's no point in thinking about it. And I'm going to be a lot better off if I just accept, okay, I can do this and not do this, so let me just focus on the things that I can do and improve. Okay, so just uh, I'll be sharing that with you, and you know I'll, I'll probably even share with you the passage uh, later on. Like um, uh, you know, I'll type it up for you, or I'll find a digital copy. Um, but anyway, I just want to give you something a little bit more uplifting. Okay. All right. So on to uh, today's lecture. Here we go. <laughs> All right. Oh, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, okay. All right, here we begin. The Manufactured Lives of Incomplete Animals. Now, before we get into today's lecture, I really, really want to emphasize the following. 
please do not uh, type in inane chatter in the chat box. Uh, that is reserved for questions only. And because there is uh, like a 20 second delay in this feed, um, I will not be able to respond to them in real time. I'm going to be taking breaks here and there during the lecture and just checking in to say, okay, how's everyone doing, you know, uh, via the chat box, and then we'll, um, you know, kind of pick up. Um, okay, so I want to start by asking this, and I know there's going to be a 20 second delay. Would you guys prefer this format where you see, you know, me and there's a small little chat box and you see the PowerPoint, or would you prefer it uh, full screen? Uh, and then just you're just gonna hear my voice. So uh, let's take a moment. Which would you prefer? Please type it in the chat. Would you prefer full screen like this, or the overlay with uh, you know my video feed and the um, chat box? So take a second. Uh, go ahead and type it in, and I'll wait for your response. Oh, the full screen is cut off? Shoot, okay, hold on. Ah, uh, okay, hold on, I'll figure it out. Okay, uh, can you guys see what's on my screen now? Here, I put up the PowerPoint. Can you guys see it now? So this is the this is the PowerPoint. This is full screen. Uh, I know I'm gonna have to wait a second for your responses, but can you guys see it? What the heck? It's still cut off? Ah! Freaking OBS. Okay, hold on. We will figure it out. I don't know why it's not working. Okay, wait. So you guys can't see the PowerPoint at all? Oh, hold on. I think I see the problem. Ha 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 ha. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Is that better? Can you guys kind of see it now? Okay, can you guys see it now? Okay, why don't we use this format? Uh, can you guys see the PowerPoint uh, now? Freaking finally. <laughs> Is it working now? Everyone can see me? Guys, I'm such a boomer. I'm so sorry. This is really like brand new for me. <laughs> um. Okay, all right, it seems to be working. You guys can see it? Okay. All right, let's get started, cool. <clears throat> the Manufactured Lives of Incomplete Animals. Again, I would encourage you to take notes either in a Google Doc or on your um, uh, pen and paper, and I will be answering several of the, uh, of the SQs as well as uh, helping you with the discussion board today. Today's discussion board is actually an option of two different questions, so just keep up with that. Here we go, sorry about that. 
All right, first things first, let's get our definitions straight. And I know a lot of you missed the lecture from yesterday, so I wanna make sure that we get these two definitions right. Culture, according to Clifford Gertz. And again, we are studying, and I actually have his book here. So we are studying a guy named Clifford Gertz. And Clifford Gertz, um, Gertz technically, is an anthropologist who studied under Wittgenstein and was heavily influenced by him. So he wrote this book, really influential book in anthropology called The Interpretation of Culture. So he defines culture as a system of symbols or a language that enables human beings to define the world they live in, express their feelings, and make judgments. Furthermore, a symbol, so, you know, system of symbols, is anything that is disengaged from its mere actuality and used to impose meaning upon existence. Okay, so I'll take a quick break right now, and uh, in the chat right now, go ahead and type in, um, what's an example of a symbol? And I know it's kind of weird, you know, interacting, because you know me, I like to interact with you guys, but uh, it's a little hard. What's an example of a symbol? Go ahead and type it in the chat, and we'll check it out in a second. Okay, I'm seeing uh, emojis, yes, or symbols. Uh, smoke, good. Yeah, I'm glad you remember that from yesterday. Smoke is a natural symbol or a natural sign. Good. Stop sign. Math, yeah, any kind of uh, a symbol. Good. Okay, yes, memes are a symbol. Thank you, Adam. Um, religion, yes. Heart. Clocks, good. Oh, uh, yes, I have it on my uh, other laptop, my um, my, my MacBook. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the chat. A uh, handshake for greeting, a biohazard sign, a thumbs up, a letter. Good. Okay. All good examples. Good, good, good. Now, what I want you to realize, though, is we are the only animals that make symbols. Now, other animals have symbols. Don't get me wrong. I, I don't want to take that away. A dog barks. A uh, howler monkey howls. Uh, a, a honeybee does that cute little dance. Those are symbols but those are natural symbols. The big difference, the one that I kind of wanted to get from yesterday, is that we human beings create symbols, like really abstract ones, other animals don't. So yesterday, the question about the orcas, I believe very strongly that orcas cannot learn animal language. They can mimic it to an extent, like a, like a parrot or like Coco the gorilla with sign language, but they can't ever truly learn it because they don't understand the abstractions that come with the language, especially creating symbols anything that is disengaged from its mere actuality and used to impose meaning upon existence. Now, I told you that we can't give our words meaning, but we do create the context and history behind the meaning of words. So I wanna make sure that we understood that uh, example. Okay, I wanna move on to my big example, and I, this is really unfortunate because we're not gonna be able to do this together, obviously, but let me explain. The big example that I would use to explain culture and symbols Uh, all right, so a lot of you probably remember uh, this uh, little activity that we had in ninth grade. And uh, so let me kind of explain what I what I meant by this. Okay, so you guys were either alphas or betas, if you recall. Uh, the alphas were the really weird, uh, touchy-feely, huggy culture that was really obsessed with males uh, and played the little game with the penny and the beans. Whereas the betas were the uh, uh, the, um, the group of uh, uh, with tr with playing cards, and you spoke in that weird language, the ka ba fa ba ka ba fa ba. If you're getting you know flashbacks, that's probably why. So okay, those are two different cultures, uh, and I want to kind of get to the bottom of okay why. In ninth grade, the reason why we do ba fa ba fa with you guys, besides you know making it super awkward your first year of court, wow, this is court, <laughs> is we're trying to get you to realize like, oh wow, uh, people start talking smack about the other culture, like literally within 30 minutes of meeting them. So in ninth grade, the lesson is about cultural sensitivity. Here it's a little different. What makes the alphas and the betas truly different when you really get down to it? What makes them different? I'll give you a second, like think about it. What really makes them different? This is a really good example of, of, of answering the, um, the SQs, by the way. What makes the betas and the alphas different? Fundamentally, I mean, it's, it's, it's a one word answer. Come on now, what unit are we in? 
Yes, children, language. Quite literally, these two groups of people have two very different languages. The Alphans speak English, but they have a very ritualized speech in which they focus on the males in their uh, lives, whereas the uh, Betas speak in a highly abstract bait and trading language. And so, yes, they have quite literally different systems of symbols or different languages. That's what accounts for them being so different. So. Uh, what makes the betas and the alphas different is fundamentally their language. But then you can apply that to literally any kind of culture, even cultures that speak the same language. Like two cultures that speak English could be totally different. Why? Because their symbols are different. Yeah, maybe their words are similar, but their symbols are different. And that's what causes the differences between cultures, says uh, Clifford Geertz. This is just a humorous example. I know, I wish we could play it, uh, but I uh, hope you guys have good memories of that. Um, you know, from uh, from ninth grade. So, uh, I mean, I certainly do. I still remember, uh, especially those of you in five, six block, God, sheesh, there were like 10 of you in that room. Uh, and I had to lead the alphas. God, that was awkward. Well, anyway, uh, I hope that, uh, you know, that can serve as an example. So again, what makes those two cultures different, the Badens and the Alphans, one more time, their language, their system of symbols is totally different. Good, good. Okay, let's move on. Oop. Or it can freeze too, that's cool too. Oh my god, my computer's frozen. Ah! One second. <laughs> this is so embarrassing, guys. Okay. Oh my god. Oh Jesus. Oh no, 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 no. Ah, whew. Okay, got it, got it, got it, got it. Oh gosh, okay, so this leads us in today's big question. And this is a question that a lot of you have been asking me for several weeks. So, how was language invented? Like in the first place, not, not how was English invented, not how was Spanish invented, how was language, human language invented in the first place? Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. Okay, all philosophical BS aside, let's take that aside for a moment, what do people need to do? What do any group of people have to contend with in order to survive, regardless of culture? Like, it doesn't matter where you live, you know, what you do. Biologically, we're all still similar humans. Even though cultures are very different, biologically, we're very similar. We have similar needs. What are some of those needs? Uh, take a moment, answer in the group chat, and I'll, uh, and I'll see your responses. So again, what are some things that all cultures need to contend with, all biological needs that humans have? Uh, take a moment. Let, let me see what you have in the chat. Okay, while you're doing that, I'll go get my dog. Hola. Hola. All right. <clears throat> okay, so we have a lot of good answers here. And oh, here's my other dog. This is Bola. He's fluffy. He's very shy, actually. He doesn't like. <laughs> oh, oh, you're an unlinguistified animal. Oh, oh, oh my God, Bola, you're getting a keyword. <laughs> anyway. Oh, oh my God, Bola. <laughs> okay, so Bola, calm down. Okay, so what I was going to say was. Uh, uh, so he being an, he being an unlinguistified animal uh, does not have a culture, and even though he has certain biological needs, like um, uh, he has certain biological needs like we do, and so I see that a lot of you are saying food, water, shelter, um, good, uh, yeah, reproduction that's important too. Um, uh, let's see, and funny enough, this dog has similar urges. So the question is this. Animals like dogs have the same urges and needs that we do. You know, they have a, a need to defend themselves. They have a need to get food, water, uh, reproduce. Um, but he, Bola, has instinctual drives. Like, he's kind of born knowing more or less what to do. Whereas, you are not. You have to be taught everything. Case in point. Let's analyze the different ways that people do the following. Just make a quick list, you know, in your mind or in your notes. Like, think about the different ways that people fight. 
Think about the different ways that people view sickness. Think about the ways that people view religion and faith and think about the way that people view sex. All of these are necessary in any human culture. Like, um, okay, kind of going down the list here. Number one, how do people fight? Well, and throughout the ages, I mean, people have fought with their, their bodies, you know, their fists, their, uh, their legs, you know, there's so many different kinds of martial arts out there and not a single human is born knowing how to do martial arts. No, I'm sorry, nobody is. And you have to be taught. Uh, same with a weapon. I mean, think about the dizzying amount of weapons that human beings have created. You know, swords, spears, shields, uh, more modern guns. Everyone has to be trained how to use those. Someone, a, la a language-using animal, has to train you how to do that. Whereas a dog, like Bola, by instinct, a dog will just go straight for the jugular. Like when two dogs like really get into a fight, they'll instinctually go for the jugular. We do not have a natural way of fighting. Our fighting has to be taught. And I suppose in a more modern, civilized society, we sometimes fight with our words or by, you know, talking smack about people over the internet. Um, that's also a form of fighting that has to be taught. That's also not natural. So I want you to start to see the contrast here. What's natural versus what's not natural. And I want you to realize there is no natural way for us to fight. Everything has to be taught. All right, sickness. Okay, now that's a pretty big one. Um, sickness, like, here's the thing. Animals will by instinct avoid certain things that can make you sick. Like, you know, they'll avoid certain things to eat, they'll avoid feces, they'll avoid like, you know, like really decayed carcasses, they'll avoid fires. By instinct, animals will avoid it, but that's evolutionary behavior. They cannot think about it, whereas you can. In fact, I'll use that as my example in just a moment. So I'll return to number two, how do people view sickness in just a moment? How do people view religion and faith? Well, religion, faith, doesn't exist without language. There's no evidence that dogs believe in anything. Is there a god, Bola? Is there a god? Hmm? I don't know. Um, and so without language, there's no... Uh, oh, 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 you're getting a little ornery there. Without language, there's no... Uh, oh, religion or faith. Okay, 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 I'll let you go. I'll let you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> okay. <sighs> so, uh, religion and faith. I mean, look, religion and faith, there's no, like, for instance, you could say something like, oh, all human cultures have a religion or all human, you know, cultures have, have some sort of faith, even if it's something in, like, science or philosophy or whatever. Yes, but when you get down to, like, the, the details, you're not born believing anything either. You're not. The, the idea of God is not in your mind. And I mean, a lot of theologians have argued that, but to me, there's just no evidence that you're born with the idea of a God. Um, now, how do people view sex? And that's pretty interesting because uh, by impulse, we do have a biological sexual drive. But who you're attracted to, um, when you have sex, where you have sex, who you have sex with, all that is determined by culture. And a lot of cultures have, you know, pretty tight restrictions on, you know, how to engage in, in sex, who to engage with, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's not like a dog where a dog will just like hump anything. If you have dogs that haven't been neutered, you know what I'm talking about. And, you know, a, a dog doesn't really care like, you know, oh, I wonder if like I can really see myself in a relationship with this dog. And no, like, it just does it. Whereas you are much pickier because you have been taught to be, because that's the way that we view um, sex, reproduction, relationships, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, if you thought I meant sex like gender, same thing applies. Uh, gender as a social construct obviously only exists with language, and that has to be taught. You're, you're not born being a, a gender, if you would. Um, so does that make sense? Okay, so all of these things, and, and this includes like how to get food, how to get water, how to get shelter. You don't know how to do any of that stuff on your own. You have to be taught everything. Okay, so, uh, and by the way, a, a, a controversy here that I'll address, because I've been seeing in a little bit of the comments here. Um, I think some people say like animals can learn from their from other animals. Like I've heard that orcas sometimes have dialects and when they speak, like, you know, depending on what part of the world they're from. Uh, I've also heard that, um, oh, like sea otters can learn from their parents to use rocks. Uh, to crack open uh, shells. <sighs> Maybe. And that's still, they're still doing a lot of research on that. But uh, in my opinion, I don't think that that's still like an abstract language. I still think that's mimicry because I don't think they're really creating symbols so much as just having evolutionary behavior. So th that, that's how I address that. Uh, sorry, I'm just looking at the comments. 
Uh, no, uh, Justin, yeah, your question. Uh, dogs, dogs naturally will go right for the jugular. Whereas you, if you're untrained in how to fight, you might just throw hands because you've watched too many World Star videos. But it doesn't make any sense because your legs are actually a lot longer and have uh, stronger muscles than your arms. But yet, why do we throw hands? Well, because that's what we usually see on TV. Uh, or that's what you've seen people do if you're not trained in fighting. Um, you have to be taught how to fight. Okay, but tell you what, in light of the recent uh, you know, outbreak, I did want to focus on one of these aspects in particular. How do we view sickness? In particular, illness. So if we go back all the way to ancient Greece. So uh, the ancient uh, Greek physician Hippocrates, uh, you know, he's the guy who uh, all doctors have to take the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, so he was a guy, I'll give you a second to read his uh, little quote there. Hmm. He is widely considered the first modern physician, like a physician in the sense of like, not like a, a, a shaman or a, or a witch doctor or like, you know, a curandera or something like that. Whereas instead of like communing with the spirits and, you know, a more like metaphysical, more spiritual sense of healing, he believed that you have to diagnose a patient and then find specific problems with that patient and then prescribe a uh, treatment. Which, and don't get me wrong, he, he, he thought a lot of wacky things. Like he thought like, oh, well, you know, maybe it's just ill humors. And he thought that like different, the different color of the fluids in your body affected you. And he thought also the, the food that you consume uh, affects your health, which again, at the time was like, what? That's crazy. But he was a, a trailblazer in many regards. Medicine does not exist without language. Animals do not have medicine. When you think about it, if an animal gets sick, it either survives and gets a uh, immunity to that uh, virus uh, or illness, or it dies, um, and that's it. And then that's natural selection. We are uh, fortunate enough, and this is a, a, a nice aspect of language. Language allows us to survive certain illnesses, and because we're able to record information, we're able to create theories, uh, we're able to view medicine in a different way, and also what causes illnesses. You know, we used to think it was. Um, uh, you know, bad behavior in this quote right here. Illnesses do not come out of, out of the blue. They are developed from small daily sins against nature. When enough sins have accumulated, illnesses will suddenly appear. You know, a lot of ancient peoples thought that sin, you know, causes it or uh, spirits or, or demons or, or something. And it wasn't until much later we realized, oh, wait a minute. No, it's actually these like tiny microscopic organisms that, uh, uh, you know, I interact with our bodies. And then, you know, very quickly, uh, uh, technology was advancing, knowledge was advancing, and all of this was due to language. Can you imagine, you know, uh, uh, dogs uh, creating vaccinations or, or, or dolphins making triage or, or orcas making hospitals? I mean, no, that, that's only possible because we're a language using animal. That's what separates us from other animals. So in regards to the current outbreak, right, when you think of COVID-19, it really is remarkable that you have been told using a language, oh, stay away from other people, you know, social distancing, quarantine, those are all words. You cannot even see this illness. Like many of us have not. This is a photograph that, you know, the CDC has shared um, using a, an, ele an electron microscope. But we don't really know what it looks like. To us, it might as well be invisible. I mean, it's easy to see how ancient people would have thought like a plague was something like... Um, you know, uh, a visit from the gods or, or, or evil spirits or an accumulation of sin, as it were. But because we have language, we're able to think abstractly, very abstractly. I mean, when you consider uh, what this uh, virus is, um, it's a huge abstraction. It requires a really big brain with language to be able to even comprehend what's going on right now. And note that your behavior is a result of language, not because of a natural instinct to avoid other people. In fact, our natural instinct might even, you could even argue, is, is to come in contact with other people and to help the sick. But we realize because of our language and our culture that that's not the route to go. So in other words, our instinctual behavior, whatever it is, has largely been overridden by language. Again, by nature, we would not even be aware of this illness. It would just sweep through the population and you know, cull the herd, to use a very uh, gross term. But luckily, because of language, we are able to, to consider it seriously, to find treatments, et cetera, et cetera. Does that make sense? Yeah, look at the comments. Um, oh, yeah, uh, to answer Fiona's question. Um, don't get me wrong. A lot of our illnesses are mental, for sure. I think this is something that's physical and very empirically provable. 
Um, uh, you know, you could say like, well, I don't know the objective truth of the nature of COVID-19, but honestly, who cares? Because this is a very practical description and it seems to be working. Um, and if we can save lives and help people, then, you know, thank you very much, language. Okay, let me pause for a second. Let me check the comments. Are there any questions so far? Yeah, uh, yes, uh, uh, Tim, I, I, can, I can see the chat. Oh, Fiona, yeah, animals do not get cancer unless they are with humans. Well, yeah, duh, who's going to diagnose them with cancer if not language using humans? Uh, it's true, I mean, like, in the natural world, imagine no humans. Uh, animal gets cancer. Well, it either gets better or it dies. And if it was able to survive and reproduce before it died, then it would just pass on those genes to the next generation. Um, it's, it's, it's not that we're, like, we are using language to impose meaning onto the world. Um, I believe very strongly that there is a natural world, like an objective world, a, a world outside the fly bottle. We simply have the tools to be able to impose meaning on it. And that's allowed us a great uh, control and predictability of nature. Get used to that phrase. It's going to come up again next unit. Uh, language gives us greater control and predictability over nature. Well, again, we'll get into that later. Uh, do, 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 do. Would it be theoretically possible for a being to have both language and instinct? <sighs> no, uh, I don't think so. Because, again, you have certain impulses and you have certain... Um, uh, drives, biological drives, but I don't think we, we as humans have an instinct uh, any longer. Um, when you think about your behavior, like you think about what you're doing right now, you know, uh, sitting in front of a computer listening to me, um, that's all language. All that behavior has been manufactured by a language. Biologically speaking, like all you want to do is like sleep and eat <laughs> when you really you know, think about it. Your behavior is being manufactured by a language. Uh, language is what makes you act the way you do. Language is what allows us to be able to identify things like COVID-19. Language is what allows us then to uh, come up with uh, uh, measures against it. Uh, no language, we would just be like any other animal. We'd just be really freaked out, uh, or, or maybe not even. You know, some people, uh, people would just start dying for no reason, and then uh, you know, we wouldn't know what to do. But because language and technology have advanced to a point where we can sort of like have ideas, we have a, a language, uh, we have a game piece to help us make you a sense of this situation. That's the main utility of language. So I don't want you to think that language is like this, oh, you're trapped in the fly bottle, you know, you're screwed. No, 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 it's a very positive development, I think. Um, and it's true, I mean, we are kind of destroying our planet too, but uh, you know, tomato, tomato. Okay. Uh, oh, Rahul, it's not instinct, that's impulse. Uh, like if I, yeah, if you touch a hot surface, your hand will recoil, you didn't even think about it. But that's an impulse. That's not like behavior would mean something that you kind of did consciously. Like to like no, no animal consciously is like, oh, I'm gonna like touch this. Like you just kind of touch this and ah, you recoil. But to then have the concept and understand, wow, my hand hurt because the surface was hot. That's only possible with a language. Uh, oh yeah, manufactured landscapes. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Marco. That was right. Uh, well, it's it, it, it's funny. I mean, yeah, manufactured landscapes is uh, yeah the idea that we are creating our own environment, and I, I agree with that. And even further, I mean, we create our own realities in a sense using language because um, we don't know what the exact objective reality is. To use a technical term, we don't know the nominal world, but we do know the phenomenal world, or what I would say is the linguistic world. Okay, let me drink some water here. Hmm. Let me uh, check in, in the chat. How y'all doing? Ah, my little thing. Let's see. Yep, 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 yep. Oh, yeah. So uh, Victoria's asking the, 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 the really good question. Uh, uh, yes. What makes us an incomplete animal is we no longer have instincts like other animals. Uh, like uh, you know, I'm, I'm just gonna I'm gonna get into that in just one second. Uh, I just want to give you guys a break, <laughs> and also me a break. There's a lot of talking. <sighs> Who is Lazanguea? Use your real name, guys. Oh, uh, and also, please, please, please. 
Uh, try to avoid uh, cluttering up the chat with inane questions. Uh, this is a lecture, and I would like people to have questions to actually get them answered. Um, okay, let's continue. Oops, ah, just kidding, just kidding. Oh, I almost forgot. <laughs> there we go. Oh, wait, nope, that's not the one either. Oh, my God. Ah, here we go. Wait, no, yes, yes, this one. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. So there are obvious differences between human cultures, right? So what accounts for all these differences in human culture? Well, I mean, we all have vastly different ways to procure and prepare food, uh, understand disease, defend ourselves, and view human reproduction. For the millionth time, language. Language. Different systems of symbols are what allow us to have different cultures and different ways of life. So if we think of a language like using Wittgenstein's metaphor, a game, then it's like two different cultures are like playing two different games in a way. It's like one of you is trying to play chess and the other person's trying to play checkers. Or one person's trying to play chess and the other person's playing mahjong. You know, I mean, it can get really confusing really fast. Even though we all have the same biological needs and urges, uh, we don't have any natural way to do any of them. We don't have a natural way to... It's, it's, it's like, okay. Everybody needs to eat, for example. You can make a blanket statement and say, all humans eat food. True. But what do we eat? When do we eat it? How do we eat it? How do we prepare it? All of those are super different depending on the culture. Um, some cultures are vegetarian. Some cultures don't eat certain kinds of foods. Uh, some cultures only eat certain kinds of foods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, all of that is part of, of a culture. You, by nature, you're not like a squirrel where you know to like naturally hoard food for the, for the winter. Uh, though I'm sure some of you have done that now. Uh, that's not a na that's not a natural instinct in you. You have to be taught how to get your food. Most of you get your food from the supermarket, uh, or I guess, you know, your parents or whatever. But that's not an instinct. Again, that has to be taught to you. In contrast to that, maybe you think Gertz is still full of it, okay? Maybe you think, oh, there, there's got to be more to us than just uh, just a mere language. Are there any cultural universals? Like, really, truly? Uh, this is a section in the reading, by the way. This is on page sorry, uh, 36 of the reading. Cultural universals. Are there any universals that all human cultures have? Take a quick minute. I'll look at the chat. Uh, are there any universals? By that, a universal is like every single human culture has this. Though note, if you say something really general like, again, all human beings have, all cultures have food. Um, all cultures have um, a belief system. Yeah, but when you start to get to the specifics, are they really universal? To take a minute, let's see what you guys come up with. Oh, Jess, uh, smiling, that's a really, really good one. Um, <clears throat> that is not universal. In fact, you know, we think of a smile as, you know, a, a positive thing, right? It's like a greeting. But actually, studies have shown that you actually smile the most when you're nervous. <laughs> you say that you, you, you smile the most when you're nervous. It's actually a sign of anxiety. And in fact, most animals, when they smile, they're showing their teeth. It's a sign of aggression. So a smile is actually not universal. You still have to be taught what a, a, a smile means. It, it's not universal. It still depends on the context in which it's being said. Yeah, that's a good one. Let's see. Uh, whale fetus, thank you. Uh, no, cultures have money. It depends on how you define money. Um, no, there's a lot of cultures that have barter. There's a lot of cultures, like especially tribal societies, hunter-gatherer societies, that uh, don't have any uh, real system of exchange at all because they don't have a sense of ownership. That's also all language. Ah, all cultures have a language. Yes, very good, very good. But what kind of language? Languages are not the same. Again, even when you get down to the specifics, to say a blanket statement like all cultures have language is true, but what kind of language? Think about the kind of like chords that we use to speak. Um, you know, I, if I try to learn, I, I could learn a language like German or, or, or Mandarin, but I'm always going to have an accent because my vocal cords haven't quite developed to say it. Si empiezo a hablar en español, 
Y hay muchos de ustedes que sí pueden hablar español, pero no pueden uh, hacer el rrr, ¿no? Sí, sí lo pueden hacer. ¿Quién lo puede hacer? <laughs> uh, it's just one example. I mean, some of us can roll our R's, some people can't. You know, uh, again, if you can roll your R's, it's like a rrr, And if I've seen people trying to like... You know, it's, 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 uh, it's hard um, to, to, to do because our vocal cords actually develop um, to, according to the language that we speak. Uh, yes, Miguel, religion, like any other social institution, is made to control. Wait until we get into Foucault next unit. Uh, yeah, language definitely affects how we eat. It is absurd. Uh, and I'm sure absurd is a very um, topical phrase right now, considering what's happening. Uh, good, 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 good. Right, uh, Aiden, uh, your sociology class. Like what human necessities? Again, even something as simple as like using the restroom, uh, you know, defecating, for instance. We have very specific rules on when and where. I mean, it's a whole traumatic experience for you, potty training. Wait until we get to Freud. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's 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 uh, there are no cultural universals that aren't super broad because as soon as you start to get into the specific details of a culture, they're not similar. Um, But hey, who knows? I might ask a question later about culture universals, but in my opinion, there are culture universals if you stick to the highly abstract, but none if you uh, get down to any, like the nitty gritty details. Okay, well, let's talk about animals for a second. Again, uh, just another contrast. Animals just seem to know what to do though, unlike us. I'm talking about other animals. Gross example, uh, the miracle of childbirth children. So the thing about animals is, let's take this, for example, this uh, gazelle. So there's a gazelle in Africa. Uh, a baby gazelle, so that's a mother birthing a baby gazelle. A baby gazelle can stand up in uh, less than an hour, uh, and within two to three hours is already walking alongside its mother, and within the day knows where to graze, where to walk with the herd, uh, how to run if there's a predator, etc., etc. Uh, it is uh, a uh, um, uh, it's instinct. Like, the, the baby is born knowing what to do. You are not. I mean, when you consider how useless a human baby is, like, how long do we have to nurture a human baby? Uh, a lot of you will say, like, 18 years, sometimes longer. Uh, it, there is no other animal in the animal kingdom that even comes close. I mean, elephants, just because, you know, they have such long lifespans and they're so massive, and some uh, apes uh, uh, raise their children for, for many years, but no one even comes close to how long we raise our youngs. A baby is utterly defenseless, a human baby. A baby gazelle is fine within a few hours, a few days at the most. Uh, it's, 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 it's wild. It is born kind of just knowing what to do. It is born with instinct, not with a language. Now, to be clear, you're not born with a language either. You are born with the capacity for a language, and that's the big difference. Does that make sense? So again, you're not born with any instincts, uh, and animals are. Other animals, you're not. Our instincts have largely been replaced by a language. Think about it, like really think about it. What you think to is natural is not natural. It is taught to you. Even things like social interaction, using the restroom, eating, all of those are socially taught. And when you consider what's happening now in our current situation, you can see that's also all very social. Okay, I'm sure you guys want me to get off this very gross image, but again, a lot of you were birthed in a similar way. Okay. To emphasize, humans, however, are different than other animals, and here's why. Da -da -da -da. We are now going to go over something that I've been hinting at for a long time. A theory of the invention of language. Now, no one knows 100% how a language is invented, but uh, I'm going to share with you a theory that, in my opinion, is the most plausible. Um, you may disagree with it, um, but I want you to consider it. And if you disagree with it, then, you know, what would, what would be your alternative? For me, it has everything to do with evolution. Okay, so let me give you the story right now. It goes like this. <clears throat> tens and tens of thousands of years ago, our hominid ancestors in uh, Africa 
uh, were like any other animal. You know, they were uh, instinctual. They had certain natural signs and symbols. Um, but in most of their regards, were like any other animal. All it would take is something to happen. Now, that something could have been a mutation. That, that That's my opinion. I think it was a mutation in the brain. It was a mutation. It could have been a drastic change in an environment. Um, I've also heard of something called the stoned ape theory. Some of you might be familiar with that, which states that uh, uh, some of our early, early, early ancestors found some psychedelic mushrooms, uh, took them, and it totally tripped them up and changed their consciousness just ever so slightly. I don't know what it was. There was some event. Again, I think it was just a mutation. But there was some tweak in some hominid's brain. I don't know what it was, but some tweak. And all it would take is just one for them to invent a word. Invent a word. Like, come up with a symbol. Maybe it was, uh, meaning rock. Or maybe, uh, meaning go right. It doesn't matter. All it would take is one abstraction, and it will germinate and expand exponentially to, over the course of thousands of years, develop into a language. Think about it. How useful would it be for survival and reproduction to be able to use an abstract term? To be able to point to something and say, you know, oh, danger. So useful. It would lead to that hominid most likely being able to survive and reproduce, you know, passing on its genes, passing on that, 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 that slight difference to the next generation. And w again, evolutionary scale is difficult to comprehend because we're not talking over the course of a few generations. We're talking over the course of tens of thousands thousands of years, a very gradual development. But words slowly start to be invented, and hominids that had bigger brains, that ordinarily, our brains are a huge liability, guys. Like, we have a big brain and a big cranium supported by a tiny little neck on, like, you know, a stem on, on our huge bodies. It's, 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 it's kind of a weakness. I mean, you get hit there, you're really screwed. The advantage, though, is with a big brain, you can learn a language. And the, the, the hominids who had a bigger, bigger capacity for learning language learned language more easily, and then they just passed it on and passed it on and passed it on and passed it on until eventually we get to... But suddenly the Australopithecus do something extraordinary. The whole group spontaneously unites and tries to turn the tables on the hunter. So to answer a few of your questions, uh, it's just a, an artistic rendering. Uh, Ryan, I believe, asked the question, it only takes one to begin making symbols, but only that one monkey, again, hominid, not monkey, has the mutation that had other monkeys understand their symbol. Uh, all it would, Animals, again, your dog can learn symbols if you teach it to them. Again, we can teach very rudimentary like sign language. Like Other uh, uh, animals do have capability of learning abstract signs that we created. So yeah, understanding is still possible, uh, especially since it can be trained. But to invent a word, that's what changed the game. Um, so, oh, uh, was the video okay? I know yesterday the video was with the Orcos was pretty choppy. How was it today? I know the quality is kind of eh, but how was the, the video? Well, I'll give you a second. And if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box. Intelligent comments only, please. Oh, good. Okay, good. good, good. Excellent, excellent. All right. <clears throat> okay, then, uh, okay, so essentially to wrap up everything I just said in a few sentences, um, I believe that language was invented because there was some mutation or some drastic change in environment, or shrooms, 
that made one hominid's brain slightly different and kind of just a word was invented. That's all it would take. I don't know how, but a word was invented and that's all it would take, especially if it was an evolutionarily advantageous uh, word. And then over the course of tens and tens of thousands of years, it would develop into a full-blown language. That's my theory. Again, if you have any uh, comments or questions, we can discuss that at a later time. Okay, let's move on. We're actually almost done for today. We have a little bit more. Okay, so now we're gonna get to the really interesting part. Culture is important. Okay, we get it. Culture, language, it's important. But now we get to a very interesting question, which is, of course, how do you learn it? Now, a lot of you have been keeping up, a lot of you have been paying attention, and your answer should be something like, well, we copy it, we, we mimic it. And then eventually, sometime, somewhere down the line, a child begins to understand those abstractions. Okay. I want to talk about a very famous uh, experiment, not thought experiment, experiment experiment in psychology. Uh, have you guys ever heard of Bobo the Doll? Uh, this is a pretty uh, interesting uh, case study. Essentially, what this guy uh, did, Albert Bandura, he was a uh, psychologist in the, uh, I believe, the 50s, the 60s. And he did a test where he was testing the aggression of young children after they had been exposed to examples of violence. Uh, it's really fascinating. Okay, <clears throat> so I guess the big question uh, to conclude today, or I was rather the big statement is this. We are incomplete animals. Unlike other animals who seem to rely on much more powerful instincts, we require a language to truly thrive and survive. In other words, we have to be taught everything. We have to be taught, uh, uh, you know, how to speak, uh, how to think. Uh, and in this case, aggression is also something that's taught. Uh, Wittgenstein's right. Aggression is not a thing that's inside of us that has to be purged, like Aristotle thought, through catharsis. No, aggression is a set of behaviors created by a language. Um, and so if you, if you mimic, you know, what you, you mimic what you see, especially as a kid, and then that's the way you behave. So what I want you to realize is the incomplete, what makes us incomplete as animals, is we lack an instinct. We don't have instinct anymore, guys. Your behavior is 99.9999% uh, shaped by language and a small little portion of it by, you know, biology. But that's that's why Gertz goes so far as to call us incomplete. Now, this point of view is controversial because there are some people that say, like, wait a minute, no, you are way discounting the effect that biology has on the human psyche and, and the human mind, and especially not taking into account the way the brain works. I admit that's a weakness of, of Geertz and Wittgenstein. It's possible that with more knowledge about the brain that we will, um, uh, oh, what the heck? Shit. Ugh. Okay, yeah, I just noticed uh, that uh, YouTube uh, blocked the stream because I was using a BBC video. Ugh, whatever, fair use. <laughs> um, okay, I guess I'll have to be more careful what videos I use. Whatever. Okay, <clears throat> anyway, everything I just said is still valid. I hope you heard it. Um, do I need to repeat myself one more time? Because I felt like it was pretty good, damn it. Uh, okay, it's fine. Okay, tell you what, I'm just going to repeat myself one more time. Here we go. <clears throat> the reason why we are incomplete animals is because we no longer have a strong instinctual drive. We don't have strong instincts. 99.9% uh, .9 of your behavior is shaped by your language and by you copying the behavior of other language-using animals. We don't have really a natural way of doing things anymore, a natural way of uh, fighting, a natural way of procuring food, a natural way of uh, walking. You have to be taught how to walk, uh, which is pretty incredible when you think about it, uh, using the restroom, etc., 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 etc. Okay.
So I want you to realize just the impact that language has on you. So it's, you know, we, 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 before we realized with, with Wittgenstein, it affects your mental life. And now I'm telling you, yes, and therefore it also affects your behavior, the language that you're exposed to, the games that you're taught to play. Um, hopefully you can see connections with what we studied before with philosophical psychology, with, uh, with a rival. Uh, there's a lot of connections to be made here. So I'm curious to see what you write in your um, SQs and what you write in your uh, discussion board. Okay, to conclude for today, a lot of you might have a very interesting question, which is, of course, oh, I'm sorry, ultimate conclusion, your behavior is manufactured. Uh, okay, that's the conclusion we reached today. But the question a lot of you might be asking, which, which I hope you are, what happens if you never get social learning? Tomorrow, we are going to go over Jeannie Wiley, uh, the girl without a language, and uh, what were the consequences for her never having learned a language when she was a kid. Um, so that will be tomorrow, uh, same time, at 11 o'clock, and uh, hopefully I will uh, work out the kinks. Uh, I think it was a little bit better today, right? Uh, I hope. It was a little bit better. Um, yeah. Oh, okay, so I'm, I'm looking through the chat right now. Um, 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 um. Okay, let's see. Oh my goodness, children. <laughs> okay, I appreciate the support, guys, and I really, really do appreciate uh, you, you know, actually, you know, getting up and uh, and, and watching the video. Uh, I really do. I, I appreciate you guys coming on. Um, Okay, tell you what, just because there is, uh, yeah, I know it's a little bit cliffhanger. Ooh. Okay, but I, I will be going over Jeannie Wiley tomorrow, what happens if you never get a language, et cetera, et cetera. I'll also make sure that they're not going to copyright the video, <sighs> YouTube, because um, I do have a, a short documentary to show you. Um, so I'll just have to double check with that. Uh, let's see. Uh, it, because a lot of you might still have questions, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to reopen that uh, Zoom um, conferencing, you know, like my office hours shortly after this lecture. So I'll do it in about five minutes. So let's shoot for 12, 10, 12, 10, I'll open up the zoom. And, um, uh, and so if you have any questions or you just like to chat for a little bit, you can join. Um, if you don't really have any serious questions about the lecture, about the content, please don't join. Cause I don't know how many people can actually get on the zoom at once at once. Um, and it, I don't think it can be all of you. Um, but until then, I just want you to remind you guys to uh, be safe, uh, wash your hands, uh, avoid going outside if you can, um, as much as possible. Uh, you know, obviously you can still exercise, you want to go for a run or a, or a bike ride, that's fine. Just avoid other people as much as possible. Uh, social distancing, which for some of you uh, introverts, some of you nerds, uh, shouldn't be very hard. Um, no names. But uh, other than that, I uh, wish you guys well. Uh, if you want to stay in contact, obviously you can always shoot me an email uh, or you can get on uh, Zoom in my office hours or right now in about uh, 1210 um, and we can talk about it. Okay. All right, guys, until then, have a wonderful day. Uh, do the best you can to be productive. Uh, stay sane, uh, stay healthy, and I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, bye.